It's great to be in our Reformation week of reminder of uh, 500 years of uh, the recovery uh, in many ways of the authority of scripture, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we have been giving this week uh, each chapel to a, uh, one of the solas of the Reformation, and today is no exception. It's our privilege to have Dr. Ron Allen, Senior Professor of Bible Exposition, uh, here. He uh, earned his BA from California State University in LA, his THM, and his THD from DTS. In addition to his teaching responsibilities, as many of you know, he preaches in churches and Bible conferences, travels the world, regularly study tours to Israel, Turkey, Greece. He's written more than a dozen books. And aside from his academic pursuits, he loves music, riding his bicycle, uh, the one that even folds up and fits in a suitcase. <laughs> he is uh, maybe the only practicing therapeutic massage therapist in the Western world, uh, but he uh, has that as a practice on the side as well as being a full-time seminary professor. Uh, he's married to Beverly, and they are celebrating 57 years of marriage. And, uh, <laughs> Bev is here, and we're glad uh, for that. They have four grown children and uh, three grandchildren. I first met uh, Dr. Allen when he wasn't a doctor. He was ABD, all but the dissertation, uh, here from Dallas when he uh, began teaching at Western Seminary in Portland, where I attended for my master's. And that was in 1972 that I met him, and he and his teaching has marked my life in many ways. And so it's a privilege to call him a friend, a brother, a colleague. Dr. Allen, would you welcome him to the platform? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bailey. It's such a pleasure to be here today when you're back and uh, the rest of you are here as well. Uh, we have uh, just one slight correction because we have people who may hear this and feel slighted. Uh, we do have four grown children, three are married, but we have 10 grandchildren. I know. And uh, if one of them heard three, when did he write me out? <laughs> <laughs> One of the wonderful things about having grown children who get married is your family enlarges not only by children being born, but before that, uh, the adding of spouses that are part of the family. And uh, one of our daughters-in-law, Lisa, who is married to our son Craig, knew that I was speaking today, and she sent me, I just got this a week ago, a Martin Luther action doll. <laughs> well, this, I don't have a lot of dolls. Uh, <laughs> this is it. But uh, this is so cool. His arms go up and down with this oversized quill. And here he's holding the, um, uh, the completion of the Bible that he translated. Uh, and, um, and he's holding it out so the German people I uh, can see that uh, these are the books of the Old and New Testament translated by Dr. Martin Luther. I just think this is terrific, isn't it? <laughs> so I put it in front of my commentary on uh, Genesis by Martin Luther on my bookshelf. And then I pulled down one of the large tomes. I have a set of books that I'll never live long enough to read, but it's the complete works of Luther in German. <laughs> and, uh, but at least I could use one of them in a picture. <laughs> and, uh, and then this wonderful uh, copy of the DTS magazine. Uh, there are still copies on the back shelf, and uh, your enjoyment, uh, enrichment of the messages this week will be greatly enhanced if you read the articles in that issue. Uh, that's just a terrific issue of that journal. Well, uh, I'm to speak on the concept of grace. Uh, sola gratia. Yesterday, if you were not in school because you have Wednesday classes, Wednesday, Friday, um, Dr. Mike Swiegel spoke on sola fide, uh, faith alone. And today, I'm speaking on grace alone. I've often said in my classes that in Hebrew Bible, after the name of God, Yahweh, the, most, the single most important word is the word chesed, loyal love, which is a word that is one of the complex of terms translated grace in Hebrew Bible. And in the New Testament, uh, charis, 
and other associated words after the name of Jesus have to be the most treasured words uh, for those who believe in our Savior Jesus. And I look at this passage, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Dr. Spiegel uh, had us in this yesterday and he rightly emphasized verse 10. But um, today the opening words for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. I look at the first part for by grace you've been saved and I think what a um, what an astonishing idea that uh, we cannot earn, we cannot pay for, we cannot merit that which is beyond um, our capacity. And God knowing our frame and loving us so has made salvation possible as an absolute gift. Uh, and I was going to say no strings attached. The only string would be the tying of the bow on a precious gift from God. And uh, it's through the, uh, the medium of faith, but look at how this verse reads. Even faith is God's gift. Because if faith is something that we muster up through our own doing, then we can take pride in um, being able to engender that which makes uh, grace possible. And uh, so Paul in this passage says, even our faith is a gift from God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And you and I, if you've been, uh, as Beverly and I, in Christian churches from a young age, you've heard this idea uh, from your youth. Maybe you came to Christ in college or university, and you were stunned uh, by the surprise of God's grace. But take yourself back 500 years ago to the time of Luther, to the time of the Western Church in which this concept had been nearly lost. Never absolutely lost, but nearly lost. And people thought, yes, the death of Christ paid a significant, um, uh, made a significant part in our salvation. But it didn't cover it all. I had one Catholic scholar tell me one time, it's like going to, out to dinner and uh, God basically pays the bill, but it's up to you to give the tip. And without the tip being paid, well, you're not quite there yet. <laughs> For by grace you've been saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. Beverly and I had a wonderful summer in 1990. It was our 30th wedding anniversary year, and um, we had a plan that had been brewing for years, of spending the summer in Europe, in continental Europe, and visiting art museums. In her college program, Beverly had a course in fine arts that just really motivated her to want to see the great artworks of the Western world in their museums. And I was a history major in college and shared the same goal. So we went uh, to Europe on our own. Uh, we um, uh, used Eurail passes, just like kids do. And uh, we rented cars, kids can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and we went on, um, on boat uh, the cruises, kids can't afford that. <laughs> and uh, we had uh, six weeks of bliss visiting wonderful places and great museums. Um, when we came to Berlin, it was in a rental car. And in those days, uh, the nation of Germany was divided into two, West and East Germany. And the city of Berlin was in two parts. And we knew that. We knew the only access to Berlin uh, from West Germany was um, uh, an autobahn from the north. And you couldn't veer off it. There was no exit. There were places to get gas and food. But that was it. And then we would leave by a similar route uh, going south. When we got to the city, we couldn't believe how busy it was. We couldn't find a place to park. And we didn't know how long I'd be in the information booth area, so I gave Beverly a bunch of coins, and she was going to feed a parking meter while I went in to try to find a place for us to stay. In the information booth, it was, uh, it was a mob scene. I couldn't believe how many people were there and how long the lines were. But finally I got up to this gracious polyglot lady who uh, told us the reason for all of this um, um, business is that that very day 
July the 1st, 1990, the division of Germany ended. Berlin was now an open city. I remember Ronald Youngblood, a Bethel Seminary professor at an ETS meeting, uh, parading uh, slides of Nefertiti, uh, the bust of Nefertiti, which was in the, um, g- the eastern part of, G- of uh, Berlin in the Egyptian Museum. And I told him that I was going to plan to go to Berlin. I said, do you think there's any way we could get into that museum? He says, Ron, it took me months to work it out. You cannot go. And I saw, I remember if he were there and I said, Ron, I can go tomorrow <laughs> because the barriers were down. It was just an unbelievable thing. And after several days in both West and East Berlin, we just took off driving. There were no maps. The West Germans who were visiting had bought every map, every tour book um, that was on any shelf in town. And the gal at the, at the desk said, just go on your own and have fun. So I said, we're going to have a Discover Luther tour. So we drove until we saw the name of a city that I could remember as associated with Luther. And one of the first places we came to after leaving Berlin was a Leipzig, which is associated with Luther, but even more so with the great musician of the Lutheran church, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. And we spent a day in the Bach house. It was unbelievable, where uh, Baroque instruments and uh, signature Uh, cantatas, um, implements of food. Everything about Bach's life was there and we were looking at it and we went into the um, St. Thomas Church and we saw the organ, even heard a recital, the organ that Bach played. And um, it was one of the most wonderful days of uh, museum uh, viewing in our life. We learned that we could go to a major hotel and order a fine meal at four It would be a dinner meal, but it would be at lunch prices. And uh, so after a very uh, great meal, we still had light. It was July. And I said, let's do a circuit of the city. So we drove around, and we saw a sign hand-painted on a worn wooden board with a point on it, and it said, Wittenberg. (laughs) Wittenberg. That's where it all began. Let's go. (laughs) So there was no sign telling us how far it was. There was um, there was no autobahn. It was cable. It was cobblestone road. And twice we had to stop for farmers as they were leading uh, sheep across the road. But we got there. We got to Wittenberg. And we were so excited, and uh, it was getting dark, and we didn't know if we'd be, uh, have any light at all when we got there. And we drove as near to the old city as we could, and we came to the central plaza here. And, um, and we saw the two domes of the city church and two statues, one of Luther and one of his partner Melanchthon. And I was so excited, and I looked over at this church, and my thoughts were, is that the church? Is that the church of the theses? Is that where Luther nailed those, um, those theses on the church door? There was no one there, and then I saw a man who was just at the edge of the plaza, a bearded, professorial type, and I walked over, and in my poor German, I asked him, is this the church of Luther? He was so surprised to hear my voice, he told me I'm the first American he's ever talked to, and he's been a university professor all of his life. But this was divided Germany. There were no Americans parading around that he had contact with. But he said to us, Schnell, schnell, schnell. You've got to rush. You've got to hurry. It's down that direction. Don't get your car run. So we ran. (laughs) And we saw the dome of the church of um, uh, of the castle, the castle church. And it was dark, but there was sun still coming on the tower, the single tower of this glorious church building. And as we got close... We could see in the resplendent setting sun the gold words on a blue field, Ein Feste Bord ist unser God, the Reformation hymn emblazoned on that 
towering dome. And as a boy who was raised Lutheran, Beverly and I both went through confirmation. We were married in a Lutheran church uh, because we had met in a Lutheran Bible school. All of those memories came back and I was sobbing, looking at this church dome and seeing those words, high as the sun was just going down. And then I said, Bev, we've got a rush. Let's find the door. And we were looking for a wooden door, and then we learned later that it burned down some years ago, but it's been replaced by a new door in which the theses are all in bronze on the door. And uh, I thought I was crying before. Now I'm just standing there (laughs) sobbing, thinking, here we are where it all began and it all began 500 years ago. Did you hear that little guy? (laughs) 500 (laughs) years ago. Yeah. (laughs) My first action toy. So, (laughs) discovering an ancient idea. There he is. (laughs) Lisa Allen. An abiding truth. There are the words again. For by grace you've been saved. Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, uh, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now some people say, well that's good for New Testament, but what happened to believers during the period of Old Testament? How were they saved? And the usual answer I get when I speak at pastor's conferences, and I ask them to fill out on a three by five card, How were people saved in Old Testament times? Usually they say by keeping the commandments. Uh, Because they feel that's so important in the Bible and keeping the commandments, I guess that's how they were saved. And um, (laughs) well, uh, that's so wrong. It's just (laughs) absolutely wrong. People were saved in Old Testament times the way they're saved today. By grace, through faith, plus nothing. Uh, the, the, I, you know, the way some people think, it's as though uh, God is talking to some of his senior angelic staff in a committee meeting he has maybe once a year, and he's saying, how's this works thing going? And the angels all report, well, uh, sir, Lord, uh, not very well. Well, let me try a new thing. Let me try grace. And they all say, oh, that's a good idea, Lord. So then we have the New Testament. <laughs> Can you imagine the idea that there would be two ways of salvation, one by works before Christ? If we can't be saved by works, how could they? If we can't be saved by righteous deeds, how in the world could they be saved by righteous deeds? No, the ancient truth goes all the way back to our father of Ram, Abraham, and in which the words are given right at the beginning of the story. He of Ram believed in Yahweh, and he, Yahweh, accounted it to him as righteousness. Here are the words, amin, amin, he believed, Baranai, in Yahweh. Vayak shavaha lo zedakah, and he, Yahweh, accounted it to him as righteousness. This is such an important verse in Hebrew Bible that when Paul is making his strongest case for salvation by grace through faith plus nothing, this is the verse he quotes in Romans chapter 4. This is the proof positive that people in Hebrew Bible times were saved by grace through faith plus nothing. Here is a possible site for the giving of uh, of uh, God's gracious gift of Torah to Israel through Moses. Uh, This is uh, Jebel Musa in the Sinai Peninsula. And um, Exodus 34 uh, describes Moses going back up on the mountain. Um, And this is after all the drama of chapters 32, 33 of Exodus. And he goes back and um, wanting to have a greater revelation of the glory of God than he'd had thus far. And God concedes to his request. He says, I'm going to show you more of my glory than you've ever seen. So what might God have spoken concerning? He might have spoken of his holiness, of his might, of his power, of his eternality. Um, Any of the things that make God God, he might have focused on. But what does he focus on to Moses? 
in what I believe to be the single most important self-revelation of God in Hebrew Bible, he focuses on his grace. God, who is compassionate and gracious, kanum uh, varachum, two words of grace that pile against each other in a hendiatus, that it, it, may, it enhances each of these words. His compassion is overwhelming. His grace is unimaginable in scope. And in patience, Eric Apiam. God tells a wonderful joke to Moses. He says, I have a very long nose. And it takes a long time for rage to reach the tip of my nose. I am of, of unbelievable patience. And most of all, I abound in chesed ve'emet, in mercy and truth. When God wants to describe himself, he could talk about a hundred, a thousand, an infinite number of things. But that which he chose to focus on is his great grace. When John wanted to introduce Jesus to his readers, basically what John did was to say, you know what God is like, abundant in mercy and truth, let me tell you what Jesus is like. And in talking about Jesus, look at the end of this very familiar verse. Full of grace and truth. And now the words are Greek, of course. Charis kaiolathia. Chesed ve'emet, Hebrew Bible, grace and truth. Uh, Charis kaiolathia, New Testament, full of grace and truth. What God is, Jesus is. And the emphasis in both Testaments is on the great grace of God. Again, after the name of God and the name of Jesus, the most uh, sweet words in all the Bible are the cluster of words that give us the idea of grace. Salvation is by grace, through faith, plus nothing. And that's what Luther was beginning to discover as he nailed those theses on the door, or sent them by FedEx. <laughs> now, the famous theses, this is the introduction. Out of love for the truth and from desire to elucidate it, the Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts in Sacred Theology, an ordinary lecturer therein at Wittenberg, intends to defend the following statements and to dispute them um, um, in that place. And then he says, um, those who cannot be present and dispute with him orally shall do so in their absence by letter. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Here's an example of one of the theses. This is number 27. They preach vanity, he says, who say that the soul that flies out of purgatory as soon as the money is thrown into chest rattles. Um, this was a parody of the um, flim-flam artist Johann Tetzel. Johann Tetzel was commissioned by um, Rome to sell indulgences where a person who's mourning the death of his mother and worrying about her spending eons in purgatory and he loves his mother and the idea that the death of Christ didn't quite pay the full bill and he could buy her way out of purgatory by paying for a, a piece of paper that's a bill of indulgence. And Tetzel would sell this so bald das Geld im Kasten klingt, die Seele in dem Himmel springt. As soon as the money hits the coffer, the soul of the one for which you've made this purchase springs into heaven. And Luther says about this, why doesn't the Pope build St. Peter's minister with his own money? since his riches are now more ample than those of Crassus, rather than with the money of poor Christians. This money was going to St. Peter's. It was also going to the cathedral at Mainz. And um, uh, Tetzel was taking quite a cut, I'm sure. And people were thinking that with a parchment of paper, uh, with the authority of Rome, they could speed the way of deceased loved ones into the glories of heaven. And uh, Luther's saying, we've got to talk about this. It's just wrong. It took a long time for Luther to complete this journey. And in some ways he didn't fully complete it because he, at his best, 
still didn't understand the grace of God that's in Torah. But nonetheless, this is, this is a change um, that is uh, epical in the history of uh, Western civilization. But you know that change 500 years ago um, still has resistance, still meets with um, contrary ideas. Um, I've spoken at lots of colleges and um, uh, Bible schools and places across a number of countries and here in America, but only one time have I ever been invited to speak at a Catholic university. I don't know why. I'm a nice Baptist boy. Why wouldn't they invite me to speak at a Catholic school? I don't know. But in 1977, Beverly and I found ourselves at a banquet at the University of uh, Portland in Oregon, where I was the speaker for this banquet for honors graduates. And they asked me to speak on a topic, they gave me a broad topic, um, archaeology, the Bible, and faith. And uh, so I worked hard on that address because I knew probably wouldn't be invited back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when we sat at the head table, there was a priest at my left who was the MC. I remember his name was Father John, and he was a very funny MC. He cracked me up. And then there was Beverly, and at Beverly's right was the president of the university, Paul Walschmidt. And we had heard as we were dressing before leaving home a television report that the president of um, the University of Portland had just been promoted to bishop of uh, Oregon. Um, and uh, so that was an extraordinary thing. So before I said something to him, dumb, like, where's your wife tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Beverly said, Beverly said, um, uh, uh, Father Walshmit, uh, tell us how you felt when you heard you've just been promoted bishop. And his face turned white and he slammed down his silverware and he said, my dear young woman, I am furious. And that's the oddest thing we would have ever expected to hear. And so um, I got on Bev's wavelength by that point and I said, uh, well tell us what, what's happened. He said, all my life I've just wanted to do good so that God would be approving of me. When I graduated from seminary, it was to go into a parish ministry. All I wanted was a small congregation in a small town where I could focus on pastoral duties. I got every book that was available on pastoral ministry, on caring for people, on building the church. And when I finally felt I was really getting good at this, I got a letter from Rome saying, we're now inviting you to come to Rome to the Pontifical Biblical Institute to begin your graduate studies. And he said, this is wrong. I'm at the point I'm really doing good at my job and they want me to leave it. But he left and he went to Rome and he earned his PhD in sacred theology and they wanted him to be a scholar. So they sent him to the University of Portland where he became professor of sacred theology. Moved up from instructor to full professor. And he said, I, I did everything I could to become the finest professor of theology that uh, the Catholic Church in the West had ever seen. And just as I felt I was doing well, I got a letter saying, we're now asking you to become the president of the university. He says, I don't want to be a president. You know what presidents have to do? <laughs> you do, the rest of us don't. He says, I don't want to do that. But he says, if that, well, so I, I gave all my library to the university. And I bought all new books on raising funds and dealing with recalcitrant faculty members and, <laughs> and dealing with the city council. And I had a whole new library. And um, at the time of his death, his service to the school in his obituary by his successor says, Without a doubt, he was the most significant and accomplished president in the history of the University of Portland. In the 1960s, Walshmitt marched for civil rights. 
He was the driving force behind the Greater Portland Council of Churches. He believed the largest, lo- he, he, the largest local interfaith group in the nation. He worked with the Jewish community years before the Vatican actually encouraged that. He said, I'm going to be the finest college president ever. And now they want me to be bishop. <laughs> and Beverly said, why don't you just say no? And he looked at her, grave, stern, shaking, my dear, a priest only says no to his holiness the Pope if he desires to spend eternity in hell. (laughs) A life lived for good, obedience, faithfulness, and promoted to bishop, he's still fearful of hell. Because the good bishop didn't learn the lessons that were taught 500 years before. That salvation is by grace, through faith, plus nothing. Sola, 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 sola. Solely by grace, solely through faith, solely in Christ, solely based on Scripture, and solely to the glory of God. Little guy, you did good. Let's pray. Father, for the surprising discovery, rediscovery of grace, we give you thanks. We know that Luther was not a perfect man, neither is any of us, but we're grateful for that which he did accomplish to the good of your people that he rediscovered and reinforced salvation by grace alone. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.